Good afternoon. Hopefully, uh, I'll try to keep this exciting to try to keep food coma at bay, um, <laughs> at least for now. So, uh, so I'm going to talk about one of those uh, undesirable uh, results or, or consequences of, of over-exploitation of groundwater, and that's land subsidence. And there's um, the poster child is right here in our very own state. Uh, in terms of the United States and really in terms of the world, and that's in the San Joaquin Valley where subsidence has been a huge problem. And we've ha had this kind of evolution of water availability and land subsidence in the Central Valley. You know, they're, you know from, the, from the early or really late 1800s through the early 1900s, you know, the valley expanded, a bunch of agriculture came in, they pumped, they had lots of surface water. And then at some point, um, the, the balance got tipped where there really wasn't enough supply and they started to have undesirable effects, including land subsidence. So uh, in response to that and to increase availability of water in Southern California, we built these huge aqueduct systems to deliver water from uh, the water-rich northern part of California to the southern part. And those were really implemented uh, by about 1970. So we've really had now um, this generation that didn't have to worry about water uh, until kind of recently when we've learned that, um, you know, for a while in the, in the 80s and the 90s, when we had a drought, we had, you know, additional pumping of groundwater to make up for lost surface water supplies. And we had some undesirable consequences, including land subsidence during those droughts. Uh, and so that's sort of how it went for about 30 or 40 years up until recently where, again, the balances have tipped. Those, those aqueducts, our water supply, our snowpack is not enough to supply all the water that California needs. So if you've ever seen anything about land subsidence, you've seen this photo of Joe Poland. He's using a telephone pole in the San Joaquin Valley to illustrate where the land surface was in 1925, 1955, and where he stands in 1977. So, uh, so subsidence in the San Joaquin Valley, it's not the only place that it's occurring in California. Uh, I usually talk about um, sort of world, you know, where subsidence is happening in the world and scope it down, but there's an abbreviated talk. So you could see, you know, in California that there's a lot of, uh, of areas where land subsidence has been identified. And if you checked out where um, the high and medium priority basins are in the maps you've seen, uh, there are some um, coincidental areas here. Uh, in the San Joaquin Valley, Antelope Valley, and, and southern areas. Makes sense, right? That's not where we have a lot of surface water availability. So we pump more in these areas. And um, the maximum areas affected and the maximum magnitude, San Joaquin comes in first in both of these categories. Um, the San Joaquin Valley in some places is subsiding at about a foot a year right now, so about a third of a meter. That is among the fastest rates in the world. Um, Mexico City is subsiding slightly faster than us, and Jakarta is right on our tail. Um, so to kind of explain what, um, oh, so that's, sorry, so the red area is kind of where I'm going to be talking about for those of you unfamiliar with California. So the kind of subsidence that, that I study, that I work on, and that I'll be talking about today is caused by aquifer system compaction. And this is a process that occurs in primarily the fine grain units, the clays and the silts. Clays are a very special grain because they're platy materials. And when these clays are deposited, they're deposited in random orientations, right? Like, like plates you would throw into a sink. Uh, there's lots of space between them. Clay holds more water than anything else more than any other kind of sediment. People don't ordinarily think about it like that. Uh, it doesn't transmit it very quickly, but it does store a lot of it. Well, when you start to lower groundwater levels past a threshold, uh, it's called the pre-consolidation stress, but it's really a certain groundwater level that, that represents the historical uh, maximum stress that system has seen, then these clays actually rearrange themselves into more like plates that you would put in the cupboard. So they stack themselves like this. So there's a lot less space between the plates, so they hold a lot less water. And they can imagine they take up less volume and then if they're oriented like this. So uh, that has the effect of compaction and is expressed as land, uh, land subsidence at the surface. 
So we care about subsidence because it, it damages um, not only the natural resources, like I just explained, the sort of reduced storage capacity, right? These plates are never going to hold as much water uh, as they did when they're oriented more randomly. Um, most people care about it really because of infrastructure damage, because it costs a lot of money. These aqueducts I was just talking about that us, us building, they largely rely on gravity for flow. And for gravity to work in a stream system, even if it's a canal, every elevation upstream has to be higher than every elevation downstream for it to flow. Um, well, that's been altered in the San Joaquin Valley because the whole valley isn't subsiding the same. It's subsiding differentially. So some parts of the canals have kind of little holes in them now. Uh, where water pools, uh, we get damaged uh, concrete liners because Anything that goes, you know, across these areas of differential subsidence that aren't flexible are going to break at some point. That includes railways, roads, but canals are the most sensitive because we rely on gravity to move the water. Um, so in the top right photo is, uh, is a well, and in a two-year time span, in, in 2010, they painted the top of the part of the well that stuck above the ground orange, so farm equipment wouldn't hit it. It's in the middle of a vineyard there. Within two years, you could see that two more feet of that casing were exposed from land subsidence. Uh, that's a gas well, so it's quite deep. But what can happen is that these causes a well collapse, so usually in the screen because that's the weakest part of the well, and it damages the well for future use. Um, the f next photo down is just a buckle on, in a concrete lining on the Delta Mendota Canal. This middle photo shows that there's no space between the water surface and this bridge that crosses the canal. Um, that's a problem. That constricts the water flow, right? When you stand on a bridge and you look over the bridge, you're used to seeing water flow under the bridge, not into the bridge. Uh, and then you saw that photo in the, uh, in the last in the last slide. So in addition to these infrastructure damages and this loss of aquifer system storage capacity, uh, you can imagine that any sort of land that you find in the low areas of the landscape, wetlands, riparian corridors, uh, those, have, uh, those can change course or migrate. Um, and so the ecosystems that depend on those systems uh, may be impacted. So there's lots of ways to measure subsidence. And all of these add something different to the story. All of them have strengths uh, that the others may not fill in. So it's really integrating these measurements is where we really learn a lot. And I'll show you uh, how we've done that as I move through the presentation. So historically, um, looks like there's no red. That's OK. Um, historically, subsidence occurred on the west side of the valley. So in the map there, uh, you could see that the darker areas are on the west side of the valley, kind of where the near, near where the aqueduct is today. Um, that subsidence was uh, approached about 9 meters by 1981 uh, from the 1920s. So uh, quite a bit of subsidence there. Uh, this is the location where we see this point data. This is an extensometer and water level data. So water level on the top, extensometer on the bottom. And as you can see on the top, you could see water levels were declining until about 1970, and then they started to recover. That's when the California aqueduct started to deliver water. So pumping was reduced, and we could see that water levels recovered really nicely. Compaction essentially stopped, uh, except for during droughts, right? We had a big drought in 76, 77. So you could see water levels crash. You could see compaction occurred. And then after that drought, Right? Water levels recovered. So we kind of thought that's what we'd find uh, when we looked again in the late, uh, in starting in about 2009. Um, but that is not what we found. And, and that's when I was talking about how, uh, you know, at the beginning of this talk, we've, we've sort of had these sort of three ages of water. You know, one before the aqueduct was built, one when the aqueduct kept up with uh, demand, uh, and then sort of where we are now in the San Joaquin Valley. So these red circles represent uh, the places where we're finding subsidence now. And I'll show you some maps of those. And those two stars in the northern circle there, uh, I'm first going to show you data from the southernmost star and then uh, data from the eastern. 
So as I mentioned, we thought that we would find the same thing now. We thought we would find this, and we have found this in some places where you could see that between droughts, there's really not a lot of subsidence and there's water level recovery. So that is happening in some areas, but not everywhere. So here we have a case, this is by Madeira, uh, where you could see that subsidence continued even between the droughts, groundwater levels still declined. Um, that was somewhat of a surprise to us. This is INSAR, so this is a satellite-based uh, measurement technique that's great for spatial information, right? It doesn't tell us about what's happened historically. We use leveling data for that. That was that map that I showed. We use extensometers. That's the compaction data I showed. But the INSAR gives us a great spatial picture of what's going on. And again, you can see these red circles. Here's our areas of concern here. And this is how we contoured it um, to make it a little bit easier to uh, interpret. So I'm going to show you a close-up of this area. Now, this was a surprise to us. So when we looked at this original map, we thought, wow, the problems are going to be down there. And I know it's a little bit hard to read because it's a little different color scale in the middle there. Um, but we thought that's where we'd find the problems. But as we learned, very little amounts of subsidence cause big problems for canal operations. So even though there was just, oh, 10 to 15 millimeters of subsidence over a few year period, this caused them to not be able to fill San Luis Reservoir, which is, is in the middle of the slide there, as much as they could have uh, given five days to fill up San Luis when we had some good rains a couple of years ago. Um, they had a number of days, not a volume of water. And because of these pinch points in the canal, because of differential subsidence, they couldn't push as much water down the canal as it was designed to carry. So just to give you a, an image of where recent subsidence is and where historical subsidence was. So going back and forth a little bit. So looking at this northern bowl, uh, we have tons of data, but I had to sort of pick and choose what I wanted to show you. Uh, you can see that the maximum subsidence is right in between the San Joaquin River and the east side bypass. This is a horrible place to have the maximum subsidence, right near these surface water bodies. The east side bypass is the most important flood co control channel east of the San Joaquin River, and it's been severely impacted. As you can see here from this cross section A prime to A, you can see as water flows that way, it has to fill up a big hole first. This is vertically exaggerated, but it has to be filled up, and all elevations below it also have to be filled up before it can continue flowing down. So that means there's flooding if it overtops the levees. Here's some GPS data. You've seen the, the lower right, right, where we've just had subsidence during, uh, during uh, drought periods, and it essentially was, was arrested between drought periods. What that tells me is they have access to surface water when there's not a drought condition. These folks up here and over by Los Banos over there, and this is Madeira, do not have access to enough surface water to meet their demands even between droughts. So what's causing these, these, this subsidence? Right, well, I already talked about it. It's groundwater level declines and it's geology. If you, you know, pump the hell out of a groundwater basin that is just filled with sand and gravel, subsidence is not going to be your biggest problem, right? You have to have both. You have to have clay. You have to have groundwater level declines. That's a shallow well. That's a deep well. Both are declining. Both are reaching historical lows year after year. This is a little bit of a weird map to look at, but uh, its point is, is that there's a lot of blue. It means there's a lot of clay. We have a lot of potential for, for additional subsidence throughout the Central Valley. So we also know that, comp so let me just go back to this real quick. We just have this layered system. It's essentially a semi-confined system underlain by what's called the Corcoran Clay Confining Unit and a deeper confined system. And we know that compaction is mostly occurring or has mostly occurred in that deeper system because of a couple pieces of evidence. First, there's this continuous GPS site and an extensometer. The extensometer is shallow. It sits on top of the Corcoran clay. So you can see there's a lot more compaction being measured or subsidence being measured by the continuous GPS site than in this shallow extensometer. 
Additionally, here's another GPS site. You see the water level in a shallow well has been flat for decades. That is not the stress that's causing the compaction uh, in the San Joaquin Valley. So just a couple more slides here. Uh, we have an extensive extensometer network. We're measuring uh, compaction at six sites every hour. And I'm just going to show you data from, from one of them. They're very useful data sets. These are critical for hydrologic models because they give us some clue as to where the compaction is happening. Um, GPS, INSAR, doesn't tell us anything. They just tell us what's happening at the land surface. Useful, but not necessarily for hydrologic models and assigning compaction to appropriate layers. So this is what the um, data look like. Um, the top graph is, is subsidence since 1935. You can see we're at about four meters at this site. This is right on the Delta Mendota Canal and is causing great problems for flow there and just the last few years kind of uh, blown up there. So the future trend, right? So we've talked about where we've been and how we've gotten to where we are today. So what's next? Well, this is a, um, a map that was made kind of on a, a business as usual um, future scenario. Uh, so Sigma is going to mess this up, I hope, um, for sure. Uh, but you can see the most of the new subsidence is on the east side of the valley. And why do you think that might be, right? Less water coming out of the Sierra is snow when we need it, right? So climate change is going to start impacting that eastern side of the valley because water is not going to be available when we need it most later in the summer for growing. So pumping is probably going to make up for that deficit. These are just some stats about subsidence. A huge swath of the valley has been affected by subsidence. Um, at least an inch a year, right? 7,500 kilometers has been affected by at least an inch a year. Uh, it's, it's adversely affecting water conveyances, um, wells, uh, roads, uh, high-speed rail has to consider this, of course, in their design. Um, subsidence occurs when groundwater levels decline, and we thought that was just going to be associated with drought, um, but it's really a much bigger problem than that. The subsidence is permanent. Those clays are not going to go back into random orientation. They are going to stay compacted, and they're not going to store as much water as they used to. And, and we have to keep at this monitoring, because we, we looked away. When we thought the problem was fixed, uh, after the California aqueduct was built, resources, like with any problem that's fixed, goes somewhere else. And so we looked away from subsidence for about 40 years, and were shocked when we looked back and saw, you know, about a third of a meter occurring. So we can't let that happen again. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>